Much love and respect. Thanks for tuning in once again. Today, once again, guys, just want to get through some of these books I've been holding on to for a while. If you're into the study of philology, of languages, you'll love this video right here. Especially when it comes to learning about ancient languages and its connection to America. And again, we're going to pull out all the uh, gems out of this book. Whatever we can, we're going to dodge the hijack if we see it. You guys already know and apply what we've learned before, what you have learned before in your journey with what we will be learning from this book today. So again, thanks for being here. We're going to get right into the book. So we're going to get into this book. I've had this book for about four years. I always want to do this video on the philology and stuff, but it's very, very complex. It will be like a whole series. And I just held it off for too long, so I'm just like, you know, let's just read this book right here and learn a little bit of, of the study of philology of pre-Columbian America from different uh, sources. So shout out to uh, Kyo. He knows how long I've had this book. One of his favorite subjects here, the philology, because it will show some relation between nations that you never thought would be related in different parts of the world. So the book is called Researches and Prehistoric and Proto-Historic Comparative Philology, Mythology, and Archaeology in connection with the origin of culture in America and the Akkad or Sumerian families. Uh oh that's Mesopotamia, isn't it? Sumerian? That's what I told you. What's Sumerians? America's a true old world. This is by Hyde Clark, member of the Anthropological Institute, core member of American Oriental Society, and of the Byzantine Philological Society and former member of the American Anthropological Institute, all right? These are real people with real credentials that wrote about these things. How many books have we read throughout the years, these different authors, these different scholars who wrote about the relationship of America in the old world? And they never showed us these books. They never told us about this. They kept us in the dark. So no more of that. We're going to read it. Let's see what he has to say. Hyde Clark. 1875 is when they made this book. The following work contains a summary of various researches and their practical application. The substance of it was read in the session of 1874 before the Anthropological Institute. But the paper, as here given and published in the journal, includes the results of subsequent investigations. We're going right into the start of his book. It says here, the old Spanish conquerors of the New World saw with wonder the buildings of Mexico and Peru, the seats, even then, of ancient empire. The fall of the Moctezumas and of the Incas was accompanied by that of the civilization of which they were the leading representatives. The progress of the new ideas of religion and policy, together with the absorbent love of gold, rapidly outgrew and displaced the marvels of the ancient and strange regime that the less regarded because heathen, the people reduced to slavery, all right? The people who? The natives, right? Reduced to what? Slavery, not Africans, 
All right, this is a whole different book. They're not even talking about slavery, but they're letting you know, lost the practice of the higher arts. And while the palaces and temples went to ruin or were buried under the thick growth of trees and creepers, no others were raised. The palaces of the viceroys and the churches of the missionaries were after foreign taste and all tended to the forgetfulness of the ancient arts, where there had been a conquering race and power as that of the Incas, it was brought down to the same level of Traldom as its former subjects, the Ayamadas. All right, so the Incas invaded the Ayamadas. So I just wanted to point that out. The Incas were an invading tribe before the Europeans arrived in the area. They weren't the ones that were there anciently, just like the so-called Aztec people. So they were conquered, as it says here, just like their former subjects, the Ayamadas, under the Spanish joke. And all ambition and all stimulus to distinction were lost, as much as the power of bringing together thousands of laborers, as the languages were no longer written except in catechisms and the old hieroglyphics, quipus. I remember we read about the quipus were disused. After four centuries, even the history that might have helped us has died off, leaving scanty and obscure remains. The great buildings of Central and South America have been sufficiently described to be known to scholars and their antique types have been the subject of much speculation during periods when the history of the human race, but ill known now, was most imperfectly understood. According to the fancy of the writer, everything has been explained by the reference to Egypt, to later India, or to China. All right? And I'm going to ask you, what Egypt, what India, and what La China? <laughs> the gradual extension of exploration and settlement in the United States has, however, brought to light the fact that vast countries, which for 300 years at least have been held by wandering savages, all right, touch the hijack, were occupied with monuments not less noteworthy and much more ancient than those to the south. Step by step, we have been brought to the conviction that the American continents have been held in times of yore by populations more or less forward, and in most cases more so than the present tribes, who have lost all knowledge of the monument builders or attribute their works to races, which it can be ascertained have no right to such a claim. So yeah, a lot of uh, modern tribes, when the Europeans were arriving, they weren't always in that area anciently. People migrate, people conquer others. A lot of years go by, thousands of years. So you got to take all that into consideration. Strange as this state of things may seem, it can be understood with a little thought by what has happened in this island. When we dig down in the city, some dozen or 15 feet, we came upon many remains of the Roman city, buried under layer and layer of house rubbish, garden mold or the ashes of fires. Still deeper, we reach bogs, where our horns and bones belong into a yet earlier time. If we go abroad, we see the hills topped with barrels, clad with thickets of trees or bare and sharp, marking out their lines against the sky around us. In the west, we see mounds of great stones, others in heaps built together, some balancing on peaks of rocks. We amused ourselves recalling these druidic monuments, until we made out that we knew little about Druids, and that these great stone monuments were to be found in many lands beyond the reach of Druids or Celts, all right? What's the relationship? Why are they finding the same things all over? Now let's apply the previous research. Who are these Druids and Celts? Thus we learn how little we truly know of what has gone by in this island, of which we fill up every nook, and scan every yard of surface they turn over with spade or plow every foot of ground. We begin dimly to look back as it were on the torn out leaves of a faded book, unknowing how to piece and patch together what should come first and what last, undoing now what seemed right yesterday, and by the help of some newfound stray bit, ecking out a blank or showing forth some awkward fault. This is our state with all the help we can bring to bear, but in the hunting grounds of the West, the bloodthirsty savage still hovers, and neither what is above ground nor what is below can be carefully researched by the few explorers. So he's calling the uh, indigenous people of America savages, so that's the hijack. And it is less to be wondered at that we know anything 
than that we know so little. They don't know anything about America. The slow bringing to light of so many records of the past gave rise to a crowd of speculations as to the mode in which America was peopled and as to the races to which the several classes of monuments are to be awarded. And to these speculations, it is of little good now to enter, as they are mostly built up without any fair ground, as the ignorance of dreaming of each man has prompted. So he means, because they have found so many old world um, artifacts here, languages, similarity to culture, ceremonies, you know, deities, hieroglyphics, inscriptions, you know, things like that. They always want to say, oh, oh, the Celts came, the Sumerians came, the Egyptians came, everybody came. So basically they tell us that nobody was here and that's totally false. They've been seeing it in reverse. That's why you find everything here. There is a source. So he's like, I'm not even going to get into all those speculations. There is no language which has not been said to have been found in America. All right. That's a big one right there. You guys here, they found all the old world languages here. Why would they all be here? And then they go out and be on their own part of the world in different sections. But they're all found here. Think about that. As well, Gaelic as Chinese or Japanese. All these are here. They're found here, which it is alleged has proved a ready means of converse. Closely knit with the whole matter, however, is that question of the population of America, which has busied many men of learning during a long time. All right. That's their number one question. Who are these people of America? Shout out to Condrop 432, the drop radio. If they can't tell you who you are, how can they tell you who you're not? But this is what's been troubling them all along. Who are you? This takes two shapes. The assumption that the Americas contain an inborn, indigenous, or original population. These are the only two possibilities. He's telling you right now. Either the Americas contain an inborn, indigenous, or original population. The other that they were people from the old world. So if I've been proving to you guys and showing you guys that this is the true old world, who had corn, who created agriculture, building all this stuff, the oldest land, the oldest water, mammals coming out of here. It could only be two possibilities. It's either we from here originally since creation or people from the old world came here. Either or, this is the old world. But we already know they're seeing it in reverse. So we're going with option one. The most logical and historical one that we can prove. America did contain an inborn, indigenous, or original population. It is a strange fancy with which the offspring of Europeans are ceased to believe that everything in America is great and original, seeing that they themselves are strangers in the land, seeing too how much they are dependent on the horse, ox, and sheep brought in by their forefathers, and on the grain first sown by them. All right, so dodge the hijack again. We got research proven the horse was here. The horse originated in America. It went to Asia and there was horses when the Europeans got here still. Check out the video we did on that. The Spanish speaking Peruvian has some excuse for this because most of his blood is Indian, but the people of New England or Virginia are without a drop or more than a drop of the blood of the Indians. Hmm, what does he mean by that? with whom they never wedded, and whom they have driven off to die out in the wilderness. Oh yeah? Is this another of those extinct stories? Oh, nothing to see here, huh? No no Indians in New England or Virginia. Hmm. Dodge the hijack. Still, there is this fancy, and every American is ready to believe that there is something especially American in the blood of the Indians. And in their speech, and these opinions react in Europe, there are distinct animals in the Western world, the puma, the llama, the condor, the alligator, the rattlesnake. The timber is other than in the East. And why should not men be so too? And of other birth. Okay. Why would a man be from different places? It has been generally affirmed that there is a common likeness between all Indians. However, far apart 
and that there is an American grammar which is said to be recognizable in every tongue. However unlike its roots may be, in America, it may be noted, is the land of a thousand tongues, which bar converse between tribe and tribe, many of them scanty in number and shut up in narrow bounds. The explanation, however, is to be sought in epics of grammar, that is, in prehistoric and not in geographical limits. Okay, the land of a thousand tongues. You guys are going to see how many times they reference this in these old uh, primary sources, how many languages, so many languages found here, more than in any other continent in the world, including Africa. And this is not because we're trying to amp up America. This is just the facts that's recorded and the research that we do proves it. This is anthropological work many people have done already and wrote about. If the population of America is of home growth, all right, if you're from here, let's say you're from here. Hi, right, guys. Let's say you guys are indigenous to America, all right? <laughs> it's of home growth and aboriginal. Let's pretend you're aboriginal. You are from this land, indigenous. Then its civilization must be either aboriginal or imported from the east by a few people, wanderers, chiefs, or missionaries. We may at this point find standing ground. True it is, stray ships and canoes do drift across the Pacific, as they may have done over the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, but we already know where the strongest currents are and which way they go. So it's vice versa, and it works the same way going out of America, and especially in the Atlantic, it actually works four times easier going towards Europe and Africa than the other way around. We got the strongest current, the Gulf Stream. It'll grab you in Jamaica and bring you all the way to Ireland. Do the research. But then the monuments in the South and in the North more particularly are so many, all right, so many monuments and of such a scale that they are beyond such slender means and show themselves as the work of great races, okay? It's not just anybody building all these pyramids here, these mounds, everything they're finding and will soon find. Shout out to all the uh, people with boots on the ground finding these ancient sites all over the world. And now we got people uh, doing it in North America and that's great. All these uh, people on YouTube, uh, showing us all these megalithic sites, so-called megalithic. Shout out to Paul, might be geopolymer. You know, we're still all learning, but they're here. And this is the work of great races. Although some identifications have here been proposed, yet the great mass of the languages of America have been no more classified than are those of Africa and Caucasia. Everywhere we meet the same phenomena, better known to us in Caucasia, a number of dissimilar languages thrown together, but proceeding from dissimilar origins. They're not all the same over there. Even in Caucasia, they're not all the same over there. This is not peculiar to the Caucasus. We find it on the Nile in West Africa and in several regions of America. We do not, however, find in the New World such phenomena of widespread languages as in the Old World the Chinese and the Indo-European, the only parallel we have is the Guarani, branch of the Aga in the Brazils. But the number is not comparable. A widespread language is the Malay. Next to this class is the extension of the Sumerian or Peru. Heguen. Hold up. Sumerian or what? Peru. Heguen. All right. Pay attention. It is, however, generally acknowledged that there is one language or race, that of the Eskimos, common to both worlds in the north of Asia and America. This is generally supposed to be that of the last comers, but it is quite within possibility that the race is very ancient, although it may have changed its language for that of a conqueror. All right, so yeah, Eskimo is definitely not the only language, right? The Eskimo language may be regarded as among the most ancient known to us and belongs to the groups of languages used by the short races and of which one form is to be observed at the very other end of the continent in Tierra del Fuego. That's down in South America, right? And uh, anciently, or in, even in pre-colonial times, Antarctica was called Tierra del Fuego. So Eskimo language, how could they be talking about the 
descendants of Japhet, what they were speaking. He was the oldest son, supposedly. These again may be ascertained to be connected by various languages spoken by low populations in the Rocky Mountains, while others are to be noticed in the far east of Brazil on the Atlantic shores of Bahia. These races, driven to the ends of the continent and to the headlands, as in the Old World, are by language and by blood in some cases allied with that kind of Negritos, or short races, huh? Of which the little men of the Minkopis in the Andamans or of Bushmen in South Africa afford a good type. These weak and low races, which may be called Pygmian, driven out by others stronger and perhaps more barbers and in early time covered both worlds covered both worlds okay they only attest ancient occupation and could not have supplied the monuments of any kind it is singular thing that in one tribe of the rocky mountains where the speech is akin to that of the short tribes listen to this just like the pygmies they found it in the rocky mountains the same language the men are as tall as their neighbors but their women are marked as being very short. So they, they conquered the little people that were in the Americas at some point, that tribe. Now, remember our slavery videos? They would kill off the men, you know, these tribes. When they invaded other tribes, they would kill off the men and take on the women and the children, right? Sir John Lubbock, British Association, Liverpool, September 1870, has even hinted at the possibility of races allied to the Eskimo having existed in England, and this is in conformity with the phenomena of human migrations, as illustrated by language. All right, so this is what I thought he was kind of saying. And he actually, guys, is comparing the Negritos pygmy language with the Eskimo, all right? And we have had references from old books of Eskimos being very dark-skinned too, and copper complexion as well. They haven't always only been pale-skinned. That's what he's telling you right here. And not just him, he just quoted somebody else. Now, it says the languages of the Aka Pygmies of the Nile, Pygmies of Herodotus, and of the Obongo of Du Chalu appear to belong to some included in the Carib the Homi. Huh? Carib the Homi. The Kata Carians. Remember? Sea peoples. Carib the Homi. The Austral Pygmian includes the Andaman Minkopi of Tikel. The Muskogogi or Creek, the Natchez in North America, the Ali Kulip and Hekinika of Tierra del Fuego. Some Tasmanian roots appear to belong to this. All right. You see all the correlation he's doing based on the philology or the languages that these people speak. Very similar to each other. But again, where's the true old world? The Septentrional Pygmian includes the Andaman. Min Kopi of Colebrook, the Shoshone, the Shoshone, Utah, Comanche, the Netella, Quiche, etc., of North America, the Bayano and Darien of Central America, the Majoruna, Kiriri, etc., of Brazil, the Dala of Abyssinia, the Gonga languages, and probably the Wolof of West Africa. But of this further is said, okay, and that's his other group. All right. Seems their languages are similar to each other in this group. Now he goes on to the polar pygmian, includes the Eskimo languages of America and Asia and the Bushmen of South Africa. Huh? And guys, you got to really think about what he's saying. Now, picture the San people of you know Africa. They're supposed to be one of the oldest people in Africa. If you really look at what they look like, a lot of light skin, a lot of Asian, what they call monoloid or with a double lid. I always had a theory and I plan to do the research on it, that they might have been some of the original Caucasus people that migrated down there. There's a whole funny history with the sand, supposedly going out of Africa and then returning into Africa. Of course, they only say out of Africa because that's what they that's the general out of Africa theory of everybody. So they had to include that. But they pick up the story of the Sun people coming into Africa. And if you don't know, go ahead and research that so you can see. So again, he's comparing the Eskimo languages with the Bushmen of South Africa. It says the Onalashkan appears to be the link between the Eskimo and the Janissian 
this latter class must be very early. A remarkable exception to the languages of the short races is that of the Aka, already referred to. The Wolof has great affinities with the pigmen. The people call themselves black. On the other side of the Wolof, on the other side, the Wolof appears to be in transition to Carib, the Homi, and to Vasco Colarian. A noticeable circumstance is that the Khand languages of central India are allied to the Wolof, namely the Gondi, Gayeti, Rutluk, Naikude, Kolami, Madi, Madia, Kuri, Keikadi, and Khand. All right. So again, the Wolof is related or sounds very similar to these languages from Hindustan, central India. So what if they actually came from there? When you guys start doing the actual research of these people in Africa, you're going to see that they have migration legends and stories as well. And most of their cheese will tell you they came from somewhere else. These languages have been much affected by Dravidian, Wolof. The surroundings of this group are no less remarkable, being except Savara. All African, namely the Gadaba, Aga, and the Kolarian, Vasco, Basque, Basque, Kolarian, allied to the languages of West Africa near the Wolof. The Sande language is that of a remarkable people of the Nile region of the Naya Naya or Nayam Nayam. Notwithstanding the opinion of Livingstone, the people must be regarded as cannibals. Hmm. Traces of their language exist in the Tasmanian and in the Sunda of Java, the Saru, the Guebesi, and the Isle of Pines. Its chiefly ally was Tasmanian. All right, Tasmanian, the Nile region, right, where Egypt, but very similar to Tasmanian. Where's the true origin? We've been seeing it in reverse, I'm telling you. The numerals appear to be in series of right and left hands. There is no appearance of the negative series. In animal names, there are conformities with the bongo or door. The Naya Naya people sharpen their teeth. Dr. A.B. Mayer of Manila, in the course of his short visit, found skulls in the Philippines with the teeth so sharpened. This had been previously described by the old traveler Tevinot. All right, they're talking about ancient skulls that had the same thing of what the people when they wrote this book had. So where was the origin? This is what I'm trying to tell you. And I bet you the Nai Nai people themselves will tell you their migration story. This had been previously described by the old traveler Tevinot. It is to be remarked that the boomerang, as illustrated by Colonel Lane Fox, in contradiction to Darwin, the scent of man, conforms to the line of the Sunday influence. All right, so now it says, with the Papuan and Australian classes, I am in no position to deal definitely except to classify them as languages of great antiquity. In both Pygmean and Sande influences are to be suspected. The Kamchatdale and the Koryak appear to me to have ancient and white relations. The Rodilla of Ceylon shows some resemblance. There is a strange coincidence with the Thug dialect of India. Five in Koryak is Milangan, equivalent to hand. In Thug, Molu is five and Gona is hand. The Garo of India appeared to constitute an early class. It has affinities to Yangaro of Gonga in Northeast Africa and perhaps to the Dula. In North America, it is perhaps represented by the Paduka, Siaka, the Sour of Savara in India, I cannot define. It stands out very distinctly among the non-Aryan languages. The Thug and Bhagwan dialects or jargons show some connection, All right? There's actually a language called Thug. That's that Thug language. The Yuma of Northwest America, all right, the Yuma is a curious family. It includes Chuchana, Oka Maricopa, all right, the Maricopa, the Diaguno, the Mojave people, the Kwakla Mayu, and Kulanapu, the latter, and the Galinomero, as hereafter said, are reputed to have affinities to the Chinese. Hmm. The Itonama of South America and possibly the Oregones are allied to the Yuma. The Lenca languages of Honduras, right? The Lenca's ancient people here, the Guajiquiro, 
the Opatero and Intibuca appear to be connected with the Kori, Koama, Legba, Bagbalan, and Kiamba. Okay. Where did they come from? Ancient America. The Carib, the Homie. All right. We're talking about Amazonians. Why? Because, yeah, they're related. This is what I've been trying to tell you. The Carib, Carians, remember, sea peoples, we ancient navigators, so called Phoenicians, all that stuff. The Carib, the Homie class includes two warlike and bloodthirsty divisions in Africa and America. In West Africa, the Wida, the Homi, Adampi, Amfue, the Krepek, the Mahi, Popo. In America, the Carib with Baniwa, the Bari, Uanambu, Judy, the Purus, Coroato, the Corope, the Guato of Brazil, Cerente, and Chavante of the Tocantins. To this group possibly belong the Coretu languages of the Orinoco. Okay, guys. And I hope for all my hardcore followers, you guys are seeing the parent tribes of these other nations that ended up in West Africa. To the Uanembu and Coretu, branches of the Caribs, the Aino of Yeso has affinities. This class may have reached America by the northern route and also by the Pacific. Through the kindness of Professor Panseri, the Marchesi, Antinori, and the Italian Geographical Society, I was favored with some early specimens of the language of his two pygmies, Akas, from the Nile region. They exhibit a conformity with the Ankaras and Wun and with the Baniwa Caribs. All right, they're just like the Caribs. Do you guys hear what they're telling you here? So when Columbus got here, the Baniwa people were here and they what have affinities with the Aka Pygmies and the Ankaras and the Wun with the Baniwa Caribs, okay? Also with Bongo, Moko, Kango, Rungo, and Wolof of Africa. Garo and Bodo of India with Aino, and strangely enough with Javanese. Short races are found in Brazil. The study of the group here named Carib the Homie is of great prehistoric interest. The Carib, the Kishai and Hueco of Texas appear to be related to the Iroquois, Pawnee and Kadu. Look at that connection. The Nicaraguan Masaya. Messiah, Messiah, Maya, Messiah, what? Is related to the North American Mandan, Jankton, Winnebago, Dakota, Osage, or Sioux. The Cherokee and Catawba of North America are related to the Abiponian of the missions of South America. Say what? <laughs> Wow, this is further studies we're going to definitely get into, guys. But this is just, you know, so we can get an idea. Now, remember the book we read of the Atalans and Istakans, you know, the Annals of Kentucky, how he was doing his whole connections. And we're going to apply that with this. You guys will see how it all starts making sense. And you're going to be able to trace the origin. Because the Mabaya, the Mobokobi, the Lela, and Lule. There appears to be a relation to the Felata of Africa. They might have came out of the Catabas. <laughs> All right, so the languages are related. The Casias are remarkable as the builders of megalithic monuments. As yet, I have not been able to affiliate this language. I have recognized resemblances to Naga, Emru, Bongo, and Begarmi. It would appear as if the constructors of megalithic and monolithic monuments were the rude predecessors of the city and temple builders. The Kasayas lie near the Indo-Chinese. He says, the Kafir and Berber classes I am unable to deal with. Dr. W.H. Bleak has shown with regard to the Bantu or Kafir, not only that it has Australasian alliances, but that its formations are to be found in the Semitic and Aryan languages. In a paper read before the Ethnological Society, I showed that the language of the Guanches we're talking about in the Canary Islands. Remember, we have shown the Guanches most likely coming out of ancient America, so-called Atlantis, was to be added to the Berber, just like the Berbers. They're related. We've shown the research of different people. So much correlation. It's all going to go full circles. The Kasi Kumuk of the Caucasus 
has affinities for the West African Kru, Yala, and Kasa, all right? Their languages are very similar, all right? These West African languages were Caucasus languages. That's your own hijacks. When you assume everybody that came out of the Caucasus was so-called Pelskin. I've been trying to tell you guys. Even the original Caucasians were melanated people, too. The Aga class is one of the most remarkable of the prehistoric epoch. The Asiatic branches are Caucasian, Abkhaz, Afkhaz, Absni, in High Asia, Kayuna, in India, Gadaba, and the Rhodesia of Ceylon, B, Australasia, Galeta, etc., Africa, North, Aga, Agadmid, Wa, Falasha, or Black Jews, <laughs> Dicella, Bertit, Shankali, Koldagi, Somali, in the West, Egbeli, Olomo, Uduma, Pati, Bayon, Bagba, Bamon, etc. America, so these are, I guess, the relations with the Aga, the languages, right? In America and North, you got the Swali, Sekumne, the Tasamak in Brazil, etc., the Guarani, the Tupi, Omagua, Mondruku, Apiaca in the missions, Morima, Saraseca on the Orinoco, San Pedro, Coretu. There seems to have been anciently a European branch, the Abkhaoi or Akivi, who afterwards became Hellenized. They became what? Hellenized. <laughs> Wow, man, we've learned so much in the past, right? When, what does it mean to be Hellenized? It don't mean you're Hellenized. It just means you're Hellenized, all right? So-called Greek, so-called influenced by so-called Greek hermetics, Hellenized. They very probably occupied Aquitania also. These are some ancient Greeks. He's letting you know they became known as Greeks or Hellenized people, just like a lot of Israeli tribes, just like some Hamite tribes and many other people, all grouped up under one tag. They very probably occupied Aquitania. To the Egyptians, they were known as Akawisha and as sons of Ham. Sons of Ham are represented in Genesis by Havilah. In the West, anciently, they were settled near the Lesgians, Lycians, Cilicians, Kelikians, Laconians, and Ligurians. Push. This class exercised a great influence in the propagation of culture. Its members seem anciently to have been all black. Its members anciently were what? So-called black. So it's not us trying to blackwash or take somebody's culture or have self-hate or anything like that. It's just facts. Deal with it. And again, that included all these language people that spoke the same similar language. He's saying... Anciently, these members were all black, and that included in America, right? The Tupi, Guarani, hello. To the Aga class, some lake dwellers may be assigned. The lake dwellers in Guiana now speak Guarani or Agao, and those of Lake Prasias were in undoubted proximity to Akahoi, nor are the older lake sites remote from the ancient Akahoi, house and village, water lake. Many of the great rivers were probably named in the Aga migrations as Iberus, etc., Parana, etc. The Agas were forerunners in America of the Sumerians. Listen to this, guys. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. So again, let's pay attention. Let's get a foundation here, a right orientation, a correct history. He's telling us these people right here that you see here, the Aga people, their language, which is similar to all those other nations in the world, including America. So they are today, today they are in Ethiopia, Eritrea. Is that the original place? Red man, red, copper, copper. I'm going to go back to the book now. He's letting us know. Pay attention. The Agas were forerunners in America of the Sumerians. So they were in ancient America, and they're telling you that it, the Guarani animal names are distinctly Aga. The Guarani, they went over there, migrated. Do you see the relation? Where's the true old world? A great class among the prehistoric languages approaching the Pro 
told his story is the Vasco Calarian Basque. In Europe, it includes the Basque in its several forms, all right? Basque. In Asia, Caucasian, the Lesgian, the Kazi, the Kumu, the Akush, Miss Jeski, the Awar, etc. In India, the Kolarian groups, Ho, Singbum, Sontali, Bumj, Bumish, Mundari, Uraon, Kuri, Yuan, etc. In Eastern Asia, Korean, ha! <laughs> In North Africa, the Furian. In West Africa, the Husa, Mandingo, Bambara, Yoruba languages. The Igbo, Ashanti, and Fanti, Kosa, Fula, connected with the Akush. Maybe the Kru, the Grebo, the Gebe, the Woi, the Basa, the Aro, Mambofia, Iswama, Isili, Yala, compare Kasik, Kumuk. For America, I have not yet determined the members, but the Welchi of the Pampas appears to be one, and perhaps the Atacapas, the Atacapas. Okay, the Vasco Colarian has three and house conforming to village and grove. The roots for tooth and bone supply names for implements. The names of beasts are based on those for the dog. And altogether, the early elements appear to belong to a stage when men were passing from an age of stone to one of bone and from caves to tree dwellings. From caves to tree dwellings. All right, let's, you know, dodge the hijack with that. Is that really what really went down from caves to trees? The grammar exhibits what I have termed the negative series well developed. Its mythology is dual, not trinary or trinitarian and traces of animism are defined. The early rudiments of culture are attested by the verbs. At present, all the northern members are white or brown, and all the southern members black, but in the time of Herodotus, blacks existed as far north as the Caucasia. Blacks were in Caucasia. So Dr. Haya, when he's saying the blacks existed all the way north, because he's still they're still going with the out of Africa stuff, guys. But he's letting you know there were so-called black people in Caucasia in Herodotus times, ancient times. Let's not forget this, what we're learning. Okay? I've been telling you, and the old Encyclopedia Britannica has been telling you, which they took out of circulation, these editions, these old editions that had this picture right here. Look how they're comparing the Caucasian with the so-called African. One striking feature is that notwithstanding the present social differences, the people are and have been warlike. The Basque resisted the Romans as they do the Spaniards. The Avars attacked the Roman Empire. The Legians under Samuel resisted the Russians and the Santos rose in rebellion against us. The Koreans beat off the Americans and French as they resisted the Chinese and Japanese. The Ashantis have encountered us in a war where Husas and Kosas also fought. So he's saying these people that have similar languages kind of always rebelled and fought against their oppressors. Now, when it comes to Basque, he's not including here. He said in America, he said probably, but there is a Basque Algonquin pidgin language. What is the relationship with the Basque and Algonquin? I plan to have a future video on that. Who are the Basque? The characteristic is general and persistent of these people, right? They speak these similar languages. The Reverend A.H. Saucy points out Basque affinities in Akkad or Sumerian. These, as well as the Ugrian affinities, are most likely to be accounted for from the Hamitic relations. In, in its Caucasian branch, the Akush may stand in relation to the scheme in Genesis, as Kush or Kush, with Misraim, Egyptian, Avila, Aga, and Canaan, Paleo Georgian. Paleo Georgian is Canaanites, okay? That is with Akkad and with Hamath. If so, these may all be treated for prehistoric purposes as Semitic. The Vasco Colarian class has this attribute that it particularly influenced the Dravidian with which it has been assimilated by Caldwell and other authorities. Its main negative roots, Gaba, conform with Sumerian Paca showing the same mental basis of formation. The Lycian language refers from the others in Asia Minor, and as pointed out, populations with allied names are found in proximity to those of Aga names. M. Lenormand has suggested that Lycian and Laconian 
or perhaps allied. It is possible to go further and suggest a distinct Lesgian origin. The Georgian is Lecky, which may be referable to Pelek and Pelasgic Helic, a son of Eber, and may include Cilicians, Kilikians, Lelegis, Lucanians, Ligurians, and Ligis. The Abkhaz and Lesgian populations may have been united in raids in the Mediterranean. What is the exact place of the Ugrian class, or what are its real constituents? I am unable to determine. By some, it is held to include four chief branches, and is treated as Altaic, that is Finnic, including Magyar, Mongolic, Mancho, and Turkic. I am by no means satisfied that the connection goes further than a common subjection to the influence of a contemporaneous prehistoric epoch, affording a community of grammar and a participation in some terms of culture. For that matter, like influences, though to a slighter degree, may be recognized even in English. So far as the Finnic or Ugrian is concerned, an important member is to be added, and that consists of tribes in East Nepal and the frontiers of Tibet and China, including Rodong, all right, with the Finnic and Ugrian, okay? So all these East Asian languages, Okay, he's going to list out Runchenbung, Chingtangya, Nak, Hering, Waling, Yakha, Chorasaya, Kulungya, Tolungya, Bahinga, Lohorong, Lambichong, Balali, Sangpang, Dumi, Kaling, Dunkmali, and Kiranti in East Nepal, Tagpa and Maniak on the Chinese frontier. Sunwar, Gurun, Mormi, Mor, Magar, and Nuwar in Nepal, and Vayu among the broken tribes of Nepal, the languages of Northwest Bengal, which are influenced by the Himalayan Ugrian, are Bodo, Boro, Kachari, and Dimal, and the Miri, Abor, and Siksagor of the eastern frontier of Bengal. It will be seen that among the above names is Magar. And this and its neighbors closely approximate to Magyar, as other languages do to Finn. All right. There is strong ground for believing that the settlement of Hungary was affected by a large body of tribes of Himalayan Ugrians under Avar of Kunsad, Hun or Lesgian leaders. There is, however, a Hung subtribe of the Limbu. Thus, a Finnic language was introduced rather from the Himalayas than from Northwestern Asia. It may be noted that on the Gabun in Africa, some affinities of language are to be traced in Banyan, Hati, Kum, Bagba, Balu, Bamon, Nagola, Momenya, Papia, Param, but these also show affinity with Aga. The Reverend A. H. Saucy has shown some strong resemblances between Akkad and Ugrin, particularly in pronouns and numerals, and these have been supported by Emmy Sayos and M.F. Lenormand. The test of pronouns accepted by philologists is very weak. In my view, the affinities are not to be regarded as confined to Ugrin, because some of the alleged affinities are common to the prehistoric epoch, and others are to be attributed to the as yet undetermined influence, which equally affects the Tibetan and the Chinese. The relation of Georgian with Akkad is very great, and yet it is nonetheless so with Tibetan, as was illustrated by Brian Hudson, Dr. Latam, Dr. Pritchard, and Edwin Norris. This view I support it, but I am inclined materially to modify it. With regard to the Mancho, I have stated in the Phoenix that the few remaining Scythian words preserved by Herodotus appear to conform. All right, Scythian or Sons of Isaac, the Malay class is to be regarded as prehistoric from the evidence of the culture of the populations, though the populations and their languages must have been largely modified by proto-historic influences. But at the same time, they bear also the impress of the ruder prehistoric classes even of the Sande, the Aka, and probably of the Pygmian, the Circassian, and Otomi, etc., the Otomi, 
and Circassian may be either intermediate between Aga and Sumerian, or are to be inclined with the latter. If so, they were outlying and advanced members, and in the occupation of America, must have closely followed the Aga. Okay, so they went out of America and followed who? The Aga ended up in where? Ethiopia? As proto-historic languages, I propose Egyptian, Sumero-Peruvian, Sumero-Peruvian, Chinese, Tibetan, and Dravidian. I proto-historic. The proto-historic languages will be found to be less widely distributed than the prehistoric, with the exception of the great branches of Sumerian, Peruvian, Mexican, etc. All right, look what he's calling Sumerian, Peruvian, Mexican, etc. And a doubtful affinity of Dravidian, they did not reach America, with the exception of the Sumerians. Okay, <laughs> it was only through the Egyptian they affected Northeast Africa and West Africa. Nor did they spread over Australasia, where the Egyptian class should be placed. I am unable to determine. It includes. As I have shown, the Ude language of the Caucasus. Egyptian contains Caucasus. All right, the Egyptian contains the Ude language of the Caucasus. Its characteristics are those of remote antiquity. Leo Reisnish, in his laborious work on the unity of language, has illustrated the connections with the Egyptian and Coptic with the Teda or Tibu class. With this subject, Dr. Karl Abel of Berlin is now dealing. Thus, we obtain a conformity of ethnographical facts observed elsewhere. For we should find Misraim in the neighborhood of Kush, in a North African center. The Sumero-Peruvian class will be dealt with in detail in the after part of this memoir. Okay, he's going to get in depth with that. The Chinese class requires to be more carefully studied, because as the Chinese have been influenced by other earlier civilizations, there have been a fancy to give to similar phenomena in other languages or in other culture a Chinese origin. But it's not Chinese. He's letting you know the alleged influence of Chinese in America is referred to hereafter as more probably Sumerian. Of the Tibetan class, the same remark is to be made. Thus, the followers of Brian Hodgson, including myself, have included under Tibetan what will most likely have to be separated. Certainly, the Himalayo Ugrin, a common religious influence, as in the case of Islam, is very apt to lead to similar and common appearances in language and culture. As regards the Dravidian class, my object is to avoid entering into detail. I believe its influence to be much smaller in truth than what Catwell and other Indian authorities. Looking at it from a Tamil standpoint, have been inclined to attribute to Dravidian. Vasco Calarian has greatly influenced this class. All right, the Basque to Dravidian should most likely be referred Japanese and Luchu, which have likewise Basque similarities. Come on, the Brahui has Tamil affinities. The Circassian of the Caucasus and the Chetemacha of North America. The Chitimaka, Chitimaka of North America shows some affinity to Dravidian, but the Circassian is allied to the Otomi of Mexico. Again, are they seeing it in reverse? And as for the present class with Sumerian, as yet I have failed to account for an important period in language and culture, which greatly influenced the historic period, passing beyond the dual system, or more properly that of pairs in positive and negative elements. A sacred system of three was introduced. In grammar, we have these triple forms in trilateral roots: the latter in Semitic and other in Aryan. Mythology was greatly affected by a trinitarian and triune system. And thanks to Toph, check out my Toph video for that. Hermetics embracing one great member, one male and one female. In grammar, there are three parts: noun, verb, and participle. These nouns. Noun, adjective, and pronoun. Three numbers, three cases, three degrees, three verbs. Active, neuter, or middle, and passive. Three persons, three tenses, three mods, three participles, three particles. Adverb, preposition, and conjunction. Three concords. As historic languages, I classify Semitic, Aryan. Okay. 
as my present program is to deal with the earlier stages of language this epoch has passed by. It is, however, necessary to observe that many roots and characteristics which are regarded as Semitic or Aryan are in reality prehistoric, and that for the consideration of the prehistoric and protohistoric periods, the historic aspect is generally useless or mischievous. The same remark applies to equally to mythology and philology. It is also untrue that Sankris in itself affords evidence as to the early culture of mankind, apart from the prehistoric languages, okay? It is part of the prehistoric languages, as he's saying. It's not its own, it's not the oldest, and we have, you know, much research that it might come out of the so-called Hebrew or the Paleo, that first mother tongue language before, right? It was split up, or what he's calling prehistoric languages, Adamite. These classes of languages, prehistoric and protohistoric, are now chiefly found in various regions, which in some periods have been centers of migration and in other centers of refuge for the earlier races driven in by those more powerful of the protohistoric and historic epics. The chief of these regions are High Asia, Caucasia, Northeast Africa, the Nile, West Africa, India, Northeast Asia, North America, Central America, and South America. The distribution and order of succession may thus be represented. All right, so this is according to him, distribution and order. And of course, he put, you know, America last. And I would say, see it in reverse, okay? So here's his table right here. He has High Asia, Caucasia, Africa, America. All right, so I flipped the page here. We got North America, Central America, South America, North Africa, and so on. You guys see the chart. It says prehistoric. Uh, proto-historic and historic, all right? This is according to what he's classifying people as, right? Pause the video if you like, check it out. All right, guys, so this is where we're going to finish part one of this video because it's a lot of reading. We don't want to make it too long so we can be able to, like, absorb the information, go over it, and people can be interested in watching the video, you know, to learn. Hope you guys enjoyed so far the reading in this book. Again, we're going to shoot the meat, spit out the bones. Or via your vegetarian, we're going to eat the watermelon, spit out the seeds, you know. <laughs> and we're going to dodge the hijack here and there. But it's something to definitely follow up on and look into. Hope it's interesting to you guys. Hope it makes a little sense what these uh, philologists and anthropologists were trying to do back in the 1800s. Stuff they never showed us. So look how down here real quick says Sumerian. Mexican, Otomi, Maya, Ayamada, Akkad. Look at that. Penguin, Georgian, Etruscan. All right, we got a video coming on that. So thanks for uh, tuning in uh, once again, guys. Again, this is just part one. We're going to continue the reading. And thanks for having the patience to, you know, hear me read on all these videos with no images going by. A lot of people are complaining about that. You know, put some images here and there. It gets boring. Hey, if this is boring, then don't watch, you know. Sometimes it just makes it easier for me when it comes to editing to just upload it like this without adding a bunch of images. It might take me an extra day or two or three days just to add images. So I appreciate you guys understanding that part. So much love and respect. Appreciate all the support. Welcome to all the new subscribers. Thanks for taking this journey with all of us. Pura vida, mi gente. Wow.